I did it. I found the world's saddest book. Lydia Tchukovskaya's Sofia Petrovna, just so we know that's the author, that's the title and the name of the protagonist. It's kind of easy to get confused when both of them seem like, you know, it seems like either or. But this is a short one, 120 pages, and it's basically just a photograph of life in the Soviet Union in 1937. So as you can imagine, it's incredibly bleak. Now what else is 1937-ish? Bulgakov. Yeah, no, this has no fantasy in it whatsoever. This is not Master and Margarita. This is totally realistic. Well, mouse pad getting in the way there. Uh, this is 100% just bleak realism. And it's very obviously based off real events. Not just in the sense that it's semi-autobiographical, but in... There's all sorts of things that just tell you, okay, this is obviously lived experience. It gets very specific, very fetishistic. And Tchukovskaya kind of distills the experience of being a mother and a widow in 1937 down into its sort of base components. So it's very good, obviously. And anyway, this novel is about Sofia Petrovna who's a typist in a publishing house. The funny thing about Soviet publishing, everyone assumes that what was going on there was basically censorship, but it wasn't actually censorship, or at least they didn't consider it to be that, because the department that basically vetted every single published book, I forget the full name of it, but the abbreviation is Glavlit, uh, they didn't consider themselves censors or kind of public moral officers. They just thought they were literary critics. You know, they might have been operating in the party line, but these guys considered themselves to be critics more than anything else. And when they took something down and when they said, you know, uh, change this element of the book or, what, or the publication because it doesn't fit in with the party morals, it was more out of a kind of feigned appreciation for the party's ideas. It was like, oh, this is not a literary idea because it doesn't fit in with what the party wants. It's not like this doesn't fit in what the part with what the party wants, and therefore it has to go. There's an extra layer of justification added to stuff that was published around this time, although this wasn't actually published in 1937. It took a, it became samizdat. It became forbidden literature. But we'll talk about that, I guess. Samizdat is this stuff that was independently printed in the Soviet Union and kind of passed around hand to hand, you know, clandestine, not properly printed. Uh, Stuff that they would burn if they found, and they would send you to the gulag if they found on you. You know, so this was one of those sort of forbidden books. Bulgakov's Master and Margarita was also originally Samizdat until it got into the West in, the, I think, the 60s. And it got a real... Yeah, a lot of Samizdat was formally published in the West before it was actually published in the Soviet Union. Because, of course, the writers couldn't get it. You know, they couldn't get anything they wanted to say through the censors. So they just sent the manuscript in a roundabout way, they tried to get it overseas, or sometimes they didn't try, but it just happened to get overseas, and it got published over there. And that made, obviously, the Russian government very angry from the top down. But anyway, Sofia Petrovna, 120 pages. What was I going to say? It's this very stark style as well, very repetitive, and it kind of reminds me of Papa Diamandis's The Murderess, which I don't have with me at the moment because I'm lending it out. Uh, in that it's just this, it's this very characterful portrayal of an old woman slowly going insane as she's torn between, because she's an orthodox believer in, I say orthodox, but I mean orthodoxy as in state orthodoxy, not religious. She's this kind of believer in party politics, but at the same time she's a believer in her son who basically is accused of, you know, nothing and taken away to a gulag. And so when she tries to reconcile her love for her son with her unfailing faith in the party, I mean, she can't do that because they contradict each other, you know. My son, Nikolai, would never commit a crime versus the party would never arrest somebody for no reason. Both of these things kind of intersect and drives her insane over the course of this book. So it's a very good psychological examination in the same way that Papa Diamandis was. And... I think I said earlier that it was somewhat autobiographical. I said that because this lady, Lydia Chukovskaya, was the daughter of, I forget his name at the moment, 
but this guy was basically the Russian version of Dr. Seuss, who wrote a ton of children's fairy tales for kids and did a bunch of literary criticism and all this sort of stuff. So she grew up surrounded by other authors and writers and literary figures. I think she was um, the personal secretary to Anna Akhmatova, the famous Russian poet, poetess, sorry. And, um, and she kind of has a lot of experience in publishing houses and the publishing world of the Soviet Union, which is where this book gets so much of its fetishistic quality, the other half being her lived experience of having her, I think, daughter taken away by the Soviet police. And there was this whole thing in the afterword of this edition. I don't even know what this edition is. Hold on. I never looked at it. I just start reading them, you know, because I don't like absorbing paratext and things before I get into the text. But what is this? Northwestern University Press. Yeah, there was this whole thing where, um, in the back of the book, where she talks about how the publishers paid her 60% of her sort of commission for this book, and then they refused to publish it after that. And she actually managed to take them to court and get them sued and earn the other 40% because they decided not to publish the book at the last second. Somehow she escaped being sent to prison. <laughs> I know of no other volume in this country. Yeah, see, they signed a contract with her. She gave them the book. They paid her, you know, 60% of the profits. And they went through all the trouble of finding somebody to do cover art and basically typeface the thing and do all of that sort of clerical stuff. And then they refused to do it. <laughs> because the publishers wanted to do it. And then... They were basically bullied into holding the thing back because one of the the chief editor was basically a liar who sold Chukovskaya out to the party and said, "Hey, there's some you know there's some sus literature going on here." And so she actually ends up kind of in the book in the character of God. I've forgotten her name. Evna, some Evna or something. Evna. It doesn't matter, but the book, look, yeah, there, there she is, Erna Semyonovna. So, the real-life publisher who kind of stabbed Chukovskaya in the back becomes the publisher of the typist who stabs Petrovna in the back in the book as well. Pick this one up, it's worth it. That's all I've got to say on that.